So, hi everyone. Uh, my talk is a little bit out of context from the session, so I hope I can still interest in you. And what I'll be talking about is a new calibration method for pervasive eye tracking. And this is for scen scenarios like gaze based interaction with mobile phones, gaze aware warning systems, and gaze constant public displays. So, you might be wondering what is this in my head? It's a head mounted eye tracker. And it's quite simple. So it's like glasses, except they have one eye camera pointing to the user's eye and one field camera pointing to his field of view. And why do we focus on these devices? Because they are inexpensive, they are flexible, and they are mobile. So they are excellent candidates for pervasive eye tracking. And they can be integrated in head up display units like Google Glass. And as technology is, uh, scales down, even in your own regular glasses. So the way that we try to figure out where the user is looking is by doing a gaze estimation, in this case regression based. So the idea is simple. You get an image of the eye and an image of the field. You detect a feature in the eye image, usually the pupil. And then you map that pupil position to a gaze position in the field image. Naturally, different pupil positions will yield different case positions. So with this, you can get a pretty good accuracy. Uh, but the catch is it, requir it requires a calibration process in order to create the function that maps the pupil position to the gaze position. And as if you go to the literature, you see that they mention it's hardly any publication of eye tracked user studies that does not report calibration problems. So it's not that trivial. Of course, you may ask, can we do it without the calibration? For example, using model-based case estimation. Here, you construct a geometric model of the eye. So if you look at the top right here, you see that you get the ocular globe and the center of the ocular globe. So in order to estimate the gaze vector, you detect the pupil and trace a ray from the center of the eye that goes through the center of the pupil like this. And then you have this gaze vector. The thing is, that's the optical axis, which for humans, it's a problem because it does not match our visual axis. So if you want to compensate for that, you need at least a one-point calibration. Second, if you have fixed setup with the cameras fixed that they don't move, you can translate this gaze vector into a position in the field image. However, these devices like SMI and Toby, glass, Toby glasses are very expensive in the order of $10,000. Uh, there are alternatives that are less expensive, like Pupu eye trackers, the one that I'm wearing right now. You can move the cameras around, so you still require a calibration. Moreover, these guys do not account for glasses, so the stronger the glasses you have, the worse will be your gaze estimation. So I'll show you now how a regular calibration works. So here you have a user and a supervisor cooperating. And the user will look at a point, and the supervisor will select that point in the field image. So here, this is called n points, and n stands for the number of points. In this case, it will be nine. The supervisor is also responsible for checking the pupil detection uh, quality at each point. So as you can see, it's not for nothing that the calibration is described as a process that presents users with a task that is of poor usability, often experienced as difficult, and frequently described as tedious. But afterwards, you get a pretty good gaze estimation, as you can see here. So for this example, it took 40 seconds to calibrate the eye tracker with a supervisor. What we are proposing, and I'll let the method introduce itself, is Calibme, calibrating with movements. So you can see the user is doing this by himself. There is no need for a supervisor. And he's done. And then you get a uh, gaze estimation similar to the one that you get with the endpoints. But it took only 10 seconds and completely unsupervised. So quick overview how this works. As you may have guessed, we are using that marker in the image to say where the user is looking at. Then the user gazes at that, the center of that marker and moves the marker around relative to the camera. So the thing is, we also don't have the supervisor now to check the quality of the pupil signal. So we also have integrated 
uh, some automatic outlier removals because poo poo detection for pervasive eye tracking is not that easy. You have a lot of challenges like reflections, bad illumination, makeup. Moreover, uh, the supervisor is also responsible for checking the quality of the gaze estimation if it's actually uh, estimating the position where the, loser, the user is looking at. Since we don't have the supervisor here, we also offer automatic evaluation with metrics in terms of accuracy and coverage. So let's go into a little bit of the deti details of the design of Calibni. First, regarding the collection marker. So if you go to the literature, they'll tell you to use a target that has a single central high contrast focal point. So that's our first requirement, a clear reference point for the user to look at. Second, because the marker will be moving relative to the camera, you get motion blur, so the detection of the marker should be robust to blur. Third, the processing. You are doing this in pervasive eye tracking. You are doing it anywhere, so you are using embedded systems which don't have all that power, and you are already uh, wasting some of it with the pupil detection, for example, which is image processing and it's expensive. So you want to be aware of the resources you have in the platform and try to minimize this. Luckily for us, there are these markers called, uh, they are fiducial markers, in this case, Aruco markers, and they are used to define areas of interest. And they are already integrated in eye tracking software because this is a very common task. So what we thought is, can we just uh, hijack one of these markers and use it for, as our collection marker? And this is exactly what we did. So we went through a dictionary and found one marker that was, uh, that we determined it was good based on the requirements that we had previously. Now, I told you that we need to remove some outliers, and I'll show you just a couple examples of some the ones that we have. So this one is based on the pupil size, and you have the, the pupil size signal here, the width and the height of the pupil, and you can see that there are some clear outliers. So uh, this outlier removal is based on the sub subsequent pupil size. So a quick example, you have the pupil being detected, and all of a sudden, the iris gets detected as the pupil. So if we look at the previous pupil, this is the size, and this is the size of the one that we got now. So you can clearly see that this um, does not behave according to the constraints of uh, the human pupil, and it's clearly separable by a single threshold, and this is how we identify these outliers. Second one here is the signal for the pupil position, so the X and Y position in the image. And you can see here on the top, there is uh, something that looks like an outlier. What happens here is uh, an inconstant pupil position because it's not the pupil being detected. A quick example, so you have the pupil being detected, then all of a sudden on the corner there, you get this dark blob detected as the pupil. Uh, the way that we remove this is by assuming that the pupil position is normally distributed. So we just draw a range containing 99% of the samples. And then anything that falls outside of this range gets removed as an outlier. And then we recalculate this range and we will remove more outliers until there are no more outliers being removed by this method. So now I'll talk a little bit about the automatic evaluation. Here we have an example of collected points. The ones in green are in liars. Red are uh, outliers that were identified automatically. So we remove them from the calibration. These are the remaining ones. Points that are inside of this region, the green region here, are interpolated. So they are much more accurate. Outside of this region, they are extrapolated and therefore it's not as accurate as inside. So for the automatic evaluation, we do this based on evaluation regions, which are appearing here in the form of ellipses, 25 in total. Inside of the ellipses, inside of this evaluation region, we select the point closest to the center for evaluation, so between all of the points that are inside of the region. So here you have an evaluation region that was covered. Here there are no points, so none get selected, so it's not covered. And the coverage is basically the ratio of uh, evaluation regions that were covered. Okay, we'll skip this one. So here's uh, an example. You have the collected points, and you get the coverage. You can see that it's 
approximately good, 56%. So the accuracy that we will report to the user will be meaningful. And how do we report the accuracy? You basically take one of those points we selected. They are not used for the calibration, so they are unbiased. You have the gaze, the actual gaze point. At the end of the vector here, you have the estimation produced by our gaze estimation method. And we calculate just the Euclidean distance between these two points as the mean accuracy and report them the mean of all evaluation points. So how did we evaluate this? Um, we compare it to a regular nine points calibration. So this is the stimuli that we used. The user sat at 1.1 meters away from the stimuli wearing a head mounted eye tracker. For nine points, we also used the chin rest. That means their head was fixed, which makes everything easier and faster and more accurate. The red points were used for calibration and the blue ones were used for evaluation. For Calibme, the chin rest was removed. The user simply gazed at the center of the marker and moved his head in an elliptical fashion. So in total, we had five participants, two, uh, four male, one female. Two of the participants wore glasses during the experiment. And here are the results. So you can see the mean angular error on the y-axis and the calibration time on the x-axis. And you want this to be closer to, both of them to be closer to zero. And here are the results that we got. So first for Calibme, I'll just mention the average values to make our life easier. So we got 0 0.59 degrees of accuracy with a calibration time of about 20 seconds. For the regular calibration, we got a slightly worse accuracy with 0 0.82 degrees, but it was slightly faster at 16 seconds. So the thing here is, the users that participated in the experiment had never used the system before, and we, had, we just let them collect points for as long as they thought necessary. So, of course, if the user knows how to use the system, he can do much better, and he knows how long he actually needs to collect the points. So we asked an expert to do the same thing, and we collected, uh, asked him to do 10 calibrations, and these are the results. So you can see that the accuracy is 0 0.69, still better than the nine points. And the average uh, calibration time was about 10 seconds. And he can do this repeatedly, robustly. Moreover, uh, for the nine points, I told you that we use the chin rest. You have also an audible feedback during the experiment, so the user knows when to move to the next point. That makes the calibration faster. And also, there were all of the poo-poo detections were good in all points, so you didn't have to kind of move the eye tracker or anything else. And if any of these are false, they, if they are not present, they will significantly increase the calibration time. So even for a novice, Calibme should still be a better method. And I'll just leave you with an example. So the user will calibrate and interact with a device here. In this case, it's a gaze control microscope autofocus here in the yellow region. And then you see the user just uses his cell phone to display the marker. There's a quick calibration. This one takes only 10 seconds. After he's done collecting, he finishes the calibration. And then you see that you get the gaze estimate, and he can operate the autofocus of the microscope just with his gaze. So to conclude my talk, what I want to leave with you is we have introduced a new calibration method for pervasive scenarios. It's unsupervised, so you don't need anyone helping you. It's accurate and it's fast, but I'm one of the developers, so don't trust me, try it. It's actually implemented in, into IREC2. It's an open source software for head mounted eye trackers. If you don't own an eye tracker, you can construct one for about $100 or so. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Hi, Daniel Ashbrook, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I, might, I might have missed it, but I'm curious what happens if the user doesn't follow the target, if they happen to look away for a moment. Uh, that's an cooperative user and then the gaze estimation will uh, approximate the gaze estimation to where he was looking, not to the actual gaze marker. Okay, so that's, that's a shortcoming of the system. Uh, 
that's not real. Uh, why would the user do that? More the question. Yeah, being distracted, maybe. Uh, yeah, that's a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, this is Philip from Bosch. Uh, I have one more question. Um, do you see? Are you still listening? Yep. Sorry. Mm. Hi, I have still one more question. I'm Philip from Bosch. Um, do you see any possibility to uh, transfer this uh, onto uh, eye trackers that use external cameras, like 3D remote, cameras? Remote, remote eye trackers. Yeah. There is a possibility, but you have to be uh, careful on how the user moves. Oh. Because if you just move your head, instead of having a calibration plane, you have actually a curved surface mm -hmm. because of the way we move our head. And then you start getting parallax errors from that. You also have the same problem if you calibrate on a plane and try to estimate the gaze on a different plane. But it can definitely be ported to remote eye trackers, and that's something we are working on. Could you account for this by modeling the the head first and then uh, measuring where the head is oriented? Uh, it's not the problem of the orientation of the head, it's just uh, the problem that the camera, the field camera is not aligned with the eye. Mm -hmm. So there is an intrinsic error there if they are at, uh, if you are, if the look easier is, if the, sorry, if the user is looking at a different distance than the calibration plane. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 